If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to turn with me to Luke 24. Luke chapter 24. And this morning, out of this last chapter of Dr. Luke's epistle, we are going to get a biblical philosophy of evangelism. We're going to see what the Bible actually says about how we should evangelize, how to get the gospel to those who have never placed their trust in Jesus Christ. And the key to everything we're going to talk about this morning, the key to this biblical approach to evangelism, is turning your verb into a noun. So if your desire is to be a great evangelist, if your desire is to be a great communicator of the gospel, then you need to turn your verb into a noun. Because the thesis of our study this morning is that a true biblical approach to evangelism places less focus on witnessing and more focus on being a witness. You see, you've got to turn your verb into a noun. And I know I just made some of you mad at me, but don't shut me out yet. Listen to me. I promise I'll make it make sense. Because I am not saying that you should stop witnessing. Listen to me very carefully again. I am not saying you should stop witnessing. It's just that ultimately, your witnessing is not going to be effective if you are not first a good witness. Because here's what you need to understand this morning. If you are a Christian by being born again, then you are a witness whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, whether you acknowledge it or not. So the question really is, are you a good one? Are you a good witness? If Jesus was the pro se defense attorney, could he call you to the stand on his behalf? And then on the other side of that coin is, if you are a good witness, you don't have to worry about witnessing because it will just come natural. If a good witness is what you are, then witnessing is what you will do. And opportunities will come. God will make sure of that. And that has to be our goal. It should be our desire to be a good witness for Jesus Christ above anything else. Anything else in life. And in our text this morning, we see how to do it. That's why it is a biblical philosophy of evangelism, because we get to see from Jesus exactly how to be a good witness for Him. In Luke 24 we see the resurrection story. And after the discovery of the empty tomb in verses 1 through 12, Luke narrates the conversation between Jesus and the Emmaus-bound disciples. It's an account that's unique to Luke's gospel. And then follows the gospel's closing scene where Jesus visits his apostles, his guys. There were actually ten present with a few other of his disciples. And so Jesus appears to them before giving them final instructions and departing. And we see that appearance starting in verse 36, which makes up our text this morning. So follow along with me as we read Luke 24, 36, down through the end of the chapter. So it's kind of a lengthy passage, but it's worth reading. Luke 24, 36, the Bible says, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, and that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And verse 48, and ye are witnesses of these things. 
And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Now as we come to the end of this gospel, it's important to note that, that Luke is only half finished with the story. The sequel comes in the book of Acts, also written by Luke. The resurrection and the ascension is the link between the two books. In fact, if you keep your finger here and look, Luke, and flip over to Acts chapter 1, I'll show you. I also put it there kind of in the sidebar of your outline, so you can read it from there if you want. Because in Acts, Luke gives just a slightly more detailed description of this exact same encounter between Jesus and his disciples. In Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4, and reading through verse 8, the Bible says, And Jesus, being assembled together with them, commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. For saith he, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So upon meditation of this story in Acts chapter 1 and Luke 24, what comes out of this is, are the key elements to being a good witness so that you can have a biblical approach to evangelism. And the first key element of being a good witness as described by Jesus in Luke 24 is that we have to have a personal message. And that message is Jesus is alive. And listen to me, since Jesus is alive, you should be alive too. And I should be alive too. In Luke 24, Jesus appears to his disciples and says, Hey fellas, it's me. I'm alive. And I'm going to take a second to paint a picture here because... I want you to get the scene in your mind. Because what a day. I mean, what a day that was. Particularly for his disciples. We know from other gospel accounts that first thing in the morning, some of the women in Jesus' life come to the tomb with their spices, fully expecting to find Jesus' remains. And listen, because this next statement is important. These women did not go believing in resurrection. They did not go to check to see if the tomb was empty. The fact that they took spices along to anoint the decaying body shows what they expected to find. So the first people who had to be convinced of the resurrection were the disciples themselves. And you know why? It was because Jesus was dead. And they saw it. And they witnessed it. And they watched him die on that cross. And they knew he was placed in the tomb. And they knew a stone was rolled over the entry. And they knew Roman soldiers were standing guard. And so because of all that, they were living their life like Jesus was dead. Hopeless, discouraged, silent, pulled back to themselves. Then as the day went on, the disciples began hearing reports that Jesus was alive. There was the report of the disciples on the journey to Emmaus at the beginning of Luke 24. Then Mary comes bumbling into to their gathering and says that, she says, I've, I've seen him. And they didn't know it for themselves, but there were rumors floating around. So they were able to gain some joy and a quick spiritual boost from someone else. But that didn't change them. Because it wasn't something they could give witness to. They hadn't seen him yet. And as we talk about a biblical philosophy of evangelism, we need to use the spiritual truth that the disciples experienced on that resurrection day as a guide to examine ourselves. Because there are Christians today, 2,000 years after the resurrection, 
still living like he is dead. And they may be saved, but their life doesn't show it. And there's no excitement about God and about spiritual things. And from a spiritual perspective, they live their lives hopeless and joyless and discouraged and silent. They live like Jesus is dead. And listen to me now, when you do that, you ruin your witness. And then there are other Christians, some of whom even come to this church. And they hear the testimonies of other folks about Jesus. And they hear reports that Jesus is alive and working. But they don't have a testimony for themselves. And they can't be an effective witness because they've heard rumors. But they don't know for sure. And they don't have a personal message to give. They can only talk about what they've heard. Listen to me. Jesus is alive. So you should be alive too. That means you should be excited about it. Because when you are excited about something, you talk about it. It becomes part of the normal conversation you have in the course of your day. If someone took undercover video of you throughout the day, will God need to do some creative editing (laughs) to turn you into a good witness for Him? I hope not, because Jesus is alive. So you should be too. And it should show up in your life and your conversation. It's like the hymn says, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is risen, whatever men may say. I see His hands of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. And you ask me how I know He lives? He lives within my heart. But for Jesus to be alive in you, for you to be excited about being a witness for Him, you have to have a personal message to give. And that's what happened to the disciples. By the time that Easter evening rolled around, all the disciples had something personal to share. And we know from Dr. Luke's sequel, the book of Acts, that they did just that. And they were excited about it in the midst of some of the heaviest persecution we've seen against the church. And they were such good witnesses that speaking about Jesus' disciples in Acts 17, 6, the Bible says, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. And they turned the world upside down. You see, they changed the world. Because they had been changed by a personal message. So the obvious question hanging from that verse is does your witness bring about change in the lives of those around you? Because if not, maybe it's because you don't have a personal message to give. When Jesus appeared before the disciples there in Luke 24, 36, He was saying, I'm here. I'm personal. It was a personal meeting so that his witnesses would have a personal message to give. He told them, look at me, touch me. Look back at Luke 24, 39. He said, behold my hands and my feet, and that it is I myself, handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. You see, we know from Luke 24, 37 that his disciples thought they were looking at a spirit, a ghost. Remember, they they had to be convinced. And, And what Jesus was saying is, I am real. It is me. I'm here. And you can now have peace because of my wounds. That's why he showed them his hands and his feet. He wanted them to see the wounds from the spikes. He wanted them to personally experience the fulfilled prophecy of Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5, that says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. 
But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes we are healed. And because of that personal experience, you can see guys like Peter give witness to it. In his writings, 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. Peter was a witness of the risen Savior. He knew that he had peace. He knew that he had been healed because he had seen the wounds. But have you? Have you seen the wounds for you? You can't be a witness from Peter's experience. It has to be more than than what you read from someone else. You can't only depend upon the testimony of another person. You have to know yourself. You have to know that Jesus is alive. Is Jesus alive in your heart today? Because if He is, then you can be a good witness. But if He is not, I don't care how much witnessing you do, you will never be effective. So you need a personal experience to give a personal message. You need to know that He is alive for yourself. You need to believe it. You need to trust it. And you need to be excited about it. But since we are giving you a full Biblical philosophy on evangelism. It can't just stop with a personal experience that gives you a personal message. It has to start there. But it can't stop there if you want to be an effective witness for Christ. Because the next thing we see Jesus do with his disciples, after he gives them the experience of seeing him, touching him, him, eating with him, is he takes them to the Word. Look back at Luke 24, verses 44 through 47. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And then he opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So the disciples had their personal experience so that they could deliver a personal message. But, and you have to listen to this because this is key, Jesus did not send out his disciples as witnesses based on their experience alone. He said, men, before you go out as witnesses for me, let's have a Bible study. And so the second key element to being a good witness is that you have to balance out your personal experience with private meditation. Because not only is Jesus alive, the Word of God is alive too. And since the Word of God is alive, it should be alive in you. You see, you need a personal experience with God so that you can have a personal message to deliver. But your experience needs to be grounded in the truth of God's Word. There are a bunch of folks out there talking about the experiences they have had and experiences they have had with God. But those experiences are contrary to Scripture. And that's a bad place to be. So if your experience doesn't line up with what God says about Himself in His Word, and you're on thin ice, man, and your message will be off, and your witnessing will drive people away from God instead of driving them to God. So your witness has got to go beyond experience. It has to go to the unchanging, infallible Word of God. That's what Jesus did. He said, okay, guys, now you know personally that I'm alive. And I see that you're excited about about sharing what you have witnessed. But you cannot separate me from what the Bible says about me. So in order to be an effective witness for me, the Bible needs to be alive in you. What you share about me has to match up with what the Bible says about me. That's what Luke 24, verses 44 through 47 says. Jesus talked to them about how the books of Moses, the Psalms, the books of the prophet, the Old Testament, all concerned him. He showed them how it all pointed to him. 
And he was able to do that because it does all point to him. The key to the entire Bible is Jesus. And he made them to see it. Verse 45 says, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. And the word understanding here in, in Luke 24, 45 means to put together. And that's awesome because many people can take things apart. But not everybody can put things together. You see, he put it together for them so that they could see how everything pointed to him. So they could know that their experience with him was based on scripture about him. So he took them to the book of Genesis. And he showed them how he is the creator and the seed of the woman. And then he opened up Exodus and showed them that he was the Passover lamb. And then Leviticus, how he was the high priest. And in Numbers, the water in the desert. And in Deuteronomy, he showed them that he's the great prophet talked about by Moses. And in Joshua, he's the captain of the, the Lord's host. And how in Judges, he is the true judge that delivers us from injustice. And he took them to Ruth and showed them how he was the kinsman redeemer. And then in 1 Samuel, how he's the all-in-one, he's prophet, priest, and king. And in 2 Samuel, how he's the king of grace and love. And in 1 Kings, how he's the ruler greater than Solomon. In 2 Kings, how he's the powerful prophet. He took him to 1 Chronicles and said, I'm the son of David that's coming to rule. He took him to 2 Chronicles and said, I'm the king who reigns eternally. He took him to Ezra and showed him how he was the priest proclaiming freedom. And he took him to Nehemiah and says, I'm the one who restores what is broken down. And then he went to Esther and says, I'm an intercessor for my people. And he went to Job and said, I'm the mediator between man and God. I'm the day spring from on high. And then he went to Psalms and said, don't you see me? I'm the shepherd. I'm the song in the morning. I'm the song in the night. And then he went to Proverbs and said, I'm, see me? I'm the wisdom. I'm our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, I'm your meaning for life. In Song of Solomon, I'm your lover and bridegroom. In Isaiah, I'm your suffering servant. In Jeremiah, I was your weeping prophet. In Lamentation, I assumed your, God's wrath for you. In Ezekiel, I showed you that I was the Son of Man. In Daniel, I was the stranger in the fire with you. In Hosea, I was a faithful husband even when we run away. In Joel, he said, I'm the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. In Amos, I'm the burden barrier. In Obadiah, the mighty Savior. In Jonah, the greatest missionary ever to live and a forgiving God. In Micah, I'm a messenger with beautiful feet. In Nahum, the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, the great evangelist crying for revival. There I am in Zephaniah, a warrior who saves. And in Haggai, restores our worship by being the cleansing fountain. In Zechariah, he was the Messiah pierced for us. And he says, there I am in Malachi, the son of righteousness, who brings healing. You see, he put it together for them. And he brought the Word of God to life. So I ask again, is the Word of God alive in you? When you open up the, the pages of this book, does Jesus jump out at you? If you want to be an effective witness, it has to be alive in you. You can't witness without the Word of God because it is your authority for your witness. You have to have an experience but if your experience goes contrary to what the Bible says, you can't witness on that. It has to be the basis for everything you share about God. So allow the excitement that you derive from a personal experience with God to drive you into the pages of this book and check yourself. Seek out a relationship with God through the Bible, and when you find it, your witness and your witnessing will be revolutionized. In our thesis we started with this morning, I told you that a biblical philosophy of evangelism places less focus on witnessing and more focus on being a witness. And that's particularly true of how churches sometimes look at evangelism and outreach activities. Because I'm afraid that at times too much of what good American Laodicea and churches do is manufactured and programmed. And, and, and I'll call it what it is, Christian salesmanship. And so we come up with clever techniques and marketing campaigns because if we're honest, we're just trying to put notches in our belts and butts in our seats. And, and hear what I'm saying. There's absolutely nothing wrong with clever techniques and marketing practices in and of themselves. In fact, 
we do stuff like that around here, and we should continue to be creative and look for new ways to get the gospel to a quickly and ever-changing culture. But what we shouldn't do, both as a church and as individuals, is rely on techniques more than we rely on God. See, I think our witnessing would go to a completely different level if instead of trying tools and tricks, we simply, simply spit time with God in the Word of God. Why don't we try just getting excited about delivering a personal message that there is a living Christ as we get encouraged in our private meditation in a living Word? I think that we're not as effective in our witness because we don't do that. And we make excuses and talk about how the world is hard and people don't want to listen to the gospel these days. I don't know. I know they don't want to listen to a Christian sales pitch. I know they don't want to see an entertainment show. But I think they're still looking for the truth. So if you're not being an effective witness, I think you need to consider your approach. Let me try to illustrate that point. Once upon a time, there was a lady named Margaret who owned a Yorkshire Terrier named Patches. And every day at exactly the same time, Margaret would go to the bathroom cabinet and take out a huge bottle of castor oil. And she would head to the kitchen to get a tablespoon. And at the sound of the drawer opening and the silver well rattling, Patches would run and hide, sometimes under the bed, other times in the bathtub, sometimes behind a recliner. Because someone had convinced Margaret that Patches would have strong teeth and a beautiful coat and a long life if she just gave him a spoonful of castor oil every day. But he hated it. So as an act of love, every 24 hours, she cornered Patches, pinned him down, pried open his mouth, and poured a tablespoon of castor oil down his little doggy mouth. And like I said, Patches hated it. Neither one of them enjoyed their daily wrestling match. And then one day in the middle of their daily battle with one sideways kick, Patches sent the battle of castor oil flying across the kitchen floor. It was sort of a victory for the dog. So, so Margaret let him go so she could run and grab the towel and, and clean up the mess. But, but when, when Margaret got back, she was shocked. Because there was Patches licking up the spilled castor oil with the look of satisfaction that only a dog could make. And I don't know why you're not getting this, because... It wasn't that Patches didn't like the castor oil. He just didn't like being pinned down and having it poured down his throat. <laughs> and sometimes our evangelism techniques feel like that. <laughs> but do you know what doesn't feel like that? Spending time with God and being a witness to exactly what God has shown you and taught you in his word. You know what God has called you to be? A witness. You know what a witness does? They just say what they've seen and heard. You know, if you, if you witnessed a car wreck and you're in, called into court, nothing personal, but the judge doesn't care about your opinion. He didn't want to give you theory of what happened. He didn't want you to, you know, let, talk this thing out. You know what a judge wants you to do if you're a witness to a car wreck? He wants you to tell him what you saw or what you heard. That's all he wants. God has called us to be witnesses. You know what he didn't call us to be? Prosecuting attorney. You know what we're supposed to do? We are supposed to give what we have seen and what we have heard. We've been you know what else? God didn't call you to be the judge. He didn't call me to be a judge. We are witnesses of these things. So spend time with God and then be a witness to what he's shown you and taught you. That, that, that's why evangelism anyone can do. You don't have to, you're not the prosecuting attorney. You don't, know how to, you don't have to know how to argue. You don't have to know how to make decisions and judge. You've got to say. You've got to tell people what you've seen and heard. Be excited about it because Jesus is alive. Be encouraged because the word is alive. And that's it. Sharing with others. That. That Jesus is alive, that his word is alive. And it all works together because the more time we spend in the pages of this book, the more we'll get excited about Jesus being alive. And the more we'll share that excitement with others. The more we can be like David and seek him, the better witness we will be. 
David said in Psalm 63, 1, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. When you go to God's word, because you know it's a lie, and you know that you will meet him in the pages of his word, and you seek him, seek him, instead of just seeking knowledge for your own self, selfish purposes. When you do that, God will honor it, and you will be a good witness for him. But if you don't see Jesus, if you don't seek him, and you're not excited that he is alive, then your witness is going to be off. You see, it's not just what you know factually, but it's what you know alive in you. Listen, you may be able to quote more scripture than anyone in this church, and you may be able to debate the key tenets of theology until you are blue in the face. But if you haven't seen Jesus, in experience, and in the Word, you will still be a poor witness. And I know you don't want to be a poor witness. That's why we're giving you a biblical philosophy of evangelism this morning. But, since I know that you do want to be the best witness you can be, even, ha even having a personal me message that has been bathed in private meditation, that still isn't enough. And I know that sounds crazy. You would think that by knowing that Jesus is alive and being excited that Jesus is alive and spending time in the living word, you would be ready to attack hell with a squirt gun. But not yet. Look at what Jesus tells his disciples after he opened their understanding of the scriptures. Luke chapter 24, verses 48 and 49. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but... Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye have been endued with power from on high. So from these verses, we get the third element to being a good witness. And that is in your witnessing delivery, you need a powerful method. And the method is the Holy Spirit who is alive. And guess what? Since the Holy Spirit is alive, he should be alive in you. Jesus said, now you are witnesses for me. You've had an experience. You have a message to give. I've met with you. You know that I'm alive. I've sat down and, and made the word of God come alive and showed you, put it together for you. How I have been everywhere in the scripture. You're witnesses, but wait. Don't go out yet. Because before you go out telling people about me, you need my power. You need to be endued with power from on high. And that word endued is an awesome word. It means clothed upon. He says you need to be clothed with my power. And that's a beautiful picture for us, to be clothed with the Holy Spirit. And, and, we, and, and we don't have time to talk about it, but it's very interesting. There are, there are three particular times in the New Testament it talks about us being clothed. We have a robe of righteousness for salvation. And we are to be clothed with the armor of God for spiritual battle. And we are also to be clothed with the Holy Spirit for witness. Now, in the Old Testament, the clothing of the, of the Holy Spirit happened at different points to different people in the Old Testament because there was no indwelling of the Holy Spirit. One example is Gideon. When in Judges 6.34, the Bible says, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet. So Gideon was clothed with the Holy Spirit. And when that happened in the Old Testament, it was always for when God's power was needed for a specific purpose. So when Jesus told his disciples that they needed to be endued with power from on high, he was doing it for a very specific reason. He was clothing them with the Holy Spirit so that they could be good witnesses for him. That's what he was talking about in Acts 1.8, when he said, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jer Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and in the uttermost part of the earth. And when, when Jesus was talking about waiting until they were endued with power from on high, he was pointing them to, to Pentecost, which was 10 days later. 
That was when the Holy Spirit came. But just like Jesus is never going to die again, Pentecost is never going to happen again. At Pentecost, He came. And now He's here. He's with us. And, 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 and ever since, every believer that has accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior is indwelled with the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation. Permanently, He doesn't come and go. Now, we still need to be clothed as witnesses. What that means is, we need to, the, as the New Testament talks about it, we need to be walking in the Spirit. We need to be led by the Spirit. But, but one of the primary reasons why God gave us the Holy Spirit is just for that, so that we can be good witnesses. And, and, and that it will bring us alive. We have to be endued with power from on high. So the church should be alive. But for some reason, that's usually not the case. And the missing ingredient in most churches and most believers today is the working of the Holy Spirit. Even though if you're saved, you have Him. He's inside you. But He's not working. And without the power of the Holy Spirit, it is impossible to be a good witness. And if you try to witness in your own power, it's just not going to work. Warren Wearsby once said that, that the hindrance to evangelism isn't the sinner, it's the saint. And that's what he was talking about. We go out witnessing, but we aren't good witnesses because we're not being led by the Spirit. And now listen to me, Harvest Baptist Church. We can't miss this point. Because in whatever we do, we have to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are trusting God to do an incredible work amongst us. And, and I'll say, if, if you're new here, you've come at a good time. Not only are we looking for God to grow us in all areas, and I'm not just talking about people, spiritually everything. We are trusting for God to do a, work, do a work in ways that we haven't seen before. But here's what you have to know. Throughout all of church history, whenever there has been a movement of the Holy Spirit within a church, there has always been a great gathering of souls. This is why we have to have a biblical approach to evangelism. Because by placing less focus on witnessing and more of a focus on being a good witness, it provides the environment and the opportunity for God to work. Evangelism, listen to me clearly, evangelism is what, what will grow our church. It's what we need to grow our church. But evangelism always follows the movement of the Holy Spirit. Whenever the Spirit of God goes to work in a church body, the result is revival. And the result of revival is evangelism. It's not the other way around. And I know it sounds weird to many of us. But if we try to use evangelism to bring about revival, it won't work. If we try to manufacture programs and methods for outreach and growth, but aren't clothed with the Holy Spirit, forget about it. It will never work. Because if we do that, we're not good witnesses. I'm just telling you in the New Testament, the church had revival originally at Pentecost. Then it was evangelistic. You don't see it the other way around. And what we try to do is we, we try to program it. Because we're not being led by the Holy Spirit. And we're not walking in the Holy Spirit as we, as we should. And we know it. And so we try to program it. And say, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do, we're going to do this, or we're going to go out here, or we're going to, we're going to do X, Y, or Z. No, it won't work. You, the Holy Spirit wants to be prime driver. And when he is in your life, and in the life of this church, the result will be revival. And when re revival comes, all of us will be evangelistic. And, and there will be a great gathering of souls. And if we try to do it a different way, that's not a biblical philosophy of evangelism. Because at the bottom line, God acknowledges and blesses that which has been touched by his spirit. Nothing more, nothing less. Jesus told his disciples to wait until they had been endued with power from on high. And listen, in the form of the Holy Spirit, God has given us and indwelled in us the, the powerful delivery method for evangelism. 
It is witnessing as we are walking in and being led by the Spirit of God. And we know that the Holy Spirit is alive. But the question is, is He alive in you? Do you walk in the Spirit? Or have you quenched Him with sin and apathy? Do you desire revival? Do you desire a gathering of souls? Do you long to see the lost brought to Jesus? Do you want to be a good witness for our risen Savior? If so, the path is clear. You need a personal message that Jesus is alive. Balanced with private meditation because the Word of God is alive. Delivered by the powerful method, which is the Holy Spirit, who is alive. Those three elements will provide you with a biblical philosophy of evangelism. And that will bring your witnessing alive.